Hi, I'm Ali Martinez. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Director of Mathematics at Student Achievement Partners, and I'm here today to talk about elevating grade level math instruction with joyful, linguistically sustaining, and culturally responsive and sustaining practices. We're really excited to talk to you today about a topic that is dear to both of our hearts, and that is elevating grade level math instruction with joyful, linguistically sustaining, and culturally responsive sustaining practices. So my name is Shelby Cole. I'm a senior designer with Student Achievement Partners. Um, have done quite a few things in the span of my career. I've done a lot of work with state collaboratives, working always in the math space, and spent a few years designing the Smarter Balanced Assessment System. Um, my favorite job, of course, was teaching high school math. And so I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the ways that we can think about improving um, the experience that students have in classrooms across the country. And Astrid Fossum, who supported the work on this presentation, is not with us today, but we wanted to just acknowledge her efforts as well. Allie, anything you want to add? I echo Shelby's excitement. We're very excited to be here today and bring our lens to how we can elevate grade level instruction in a way that really centers students. Let's jump right in. So Allie and I are with Student Achievement Partners. We are an education nonprofit and we are committed to ensuring that all students, no matter who they are or where they live, are supported in accessing and successfully engaging with literacy and mathematics content in the classroom. And I love to expand the notion of classroom when I talk about it, because I think education spaces, when we think of classroom, we think of sort of a typical space of learning that is enclosed in four walls and it's 2023. And so the ways that students access education are, are changing rapidly. And so I want folks to take a really broad lens even to the word classroom, which probably brings up some typical images when we say it. So I want to tell, start maybe with a little story. Just I, I said my favorite job was teaching. And so what am I doing at Student Achievement Partners? Why am I not still teaching? That's a great question. And I'm really glad you asked. Um, so I taught at a high school in Connecticut that was about one third black, one third Latinx, one third white. And in a high school like that, the disparities that exist are very obvious. Um, and so in the four years that I was teaching, I noticed a lot. And in, in particular at the high school that I was teaching at, you could look into a classroom and predict the name of the course based on who was sitting in that classroom. And so for four years as a teacher, I was constantly moving students from one class to another to make sure that they had access to what they needed so that they would be successful in the future. But that wasn't a practice that I saw other teachers engaging in. And so when I left the classroom, it was to really study the issues that I was observing in the school that I was working at. And I found that there were really deep disparities in terms of who had access to what mathematics and those disparities start really early. So even though I saw them in ninth grade and we often assume that like tracking starts in a, in a particular place, it actually those practices start much earlier. Um, so it's really important to know that student achievement partners, we work with folks who, who do believe that mathematics and literacy education can be reimagined and re redesigned to eradicate those inequities. We can tell why I love working with Shelby. Uh, when uh, we got an invitation to speak at this uh, conference, I circled up with Ostrid and Shelby, and we looked at this idea of how are we gonna speak about academic recovery strategies and unfinished learning? And so we started by really investing some time thinking about the language we use in our educational landscape to talk about students. I don't often talk like this, but I have to say, the first thing that came to mind is, you know, Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And when I think about the labels that we have in our system, I'd rewrite it as a dirty sock by any other name would smell as bad. The dirty sock in education comes to us in the form of these labels like behind at risk, low. We might say a student has unfinished learning or students are below standard. And when we frame labels in this particular way, we're situating students as to blame, as if they need to be fixed 
or if they are broken. This deficit-based language has long served as a barrier to students and teaching and learning long before the pandemic. So we'd like you to take a moment to, to reflect and think of a time when you felt that you were behind. Maybe it was a time when you saw most students in your class were reaching for the red books, but you were still on the blue books. Or maybe it was a time when it felt like your classmates really got it, but you were still sitting and puzzling and processing. When we're in these moments, they haunt us. They can become part of our identity. And sometimes they become forces that even close doors for us, making us feel less confident, and in some cases, very aware that we're being treated differently than a peer or another group. Uh, I'm gonna have us take this for a moment into maybe what we might think is a silly example, but go with me on this journey. Most states have driving ages around 17 and 18 years old. So let's think about what it means to be behind if we're talking about the driving age. Okay, so if you're older than 18 years old, are you behind? This 19 year old wouldn't ever learn to drive? Does it mean that you're above average in driving if you got into the driver's seat at 14? Does this mean you, because you learned to drive earlier, you have a predisposition, a talent for driving because you could do it sooner? Seems silly in this example, it's pretty obvious. Of course, in this case, we wouldn't bat an eye if students were outside the range that we've depicted here. But here's the challenge. The big problem comes when we look at a range and instead of thinking of a range, we see it as a norm. If we look at a room of 17 and eight year olds, we might assume each and every single one of them is learning to drive. And, and that's easy to assume. We lean into dominant Eurocentric culture, likely our own experiences, and we just expect it. We expect every 17 and 18 year old is learning to drive. That's their experience, it must be. And if one of them isn't as we expected, it wouldn't be strange for us to wonder what went wrong, why not? The reality is that when we're using the labels of students being behind at risk, coming into classrooms with unfinished learning, what we're really pointing out is that learners are joining the classroom with a different set of understandings than we expected. We, adults in this space, we developed assumptions of what students were going to know and how we were going to teach them. And what we planned based on those assumptions isn't working. For the group of students in our classrooms, COVID certainly played a role. But it isn't the only reason why there are differences. And yes, these differences were here long before the COVID pandemic. These differences can be attributed to a number of factors, all of which lie largely in the educational system itself and how it was designed and the adults around it. There are systemic challenges, a number of them. For one, we don't look like our students. As the racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and linguistic makeup of our schools becomes increasingly diverse, recent DOE study found that the population, population of educators in our systems are 100% middle class, 80% white, 75% identify as women, and 90% as monolingual. And as our system grossly misidentifies Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous students with learning disabilities, white students who are identified are more likely to be in general ed classrooms than all other students combined. And these are just a few. And of these systemic challenge, many are maintained and amplified by policies that are inside of our systems. For example, we have English only classrooms where rich student voice is actively silenced. Their placement policies, like what Shelby was describing for young kids, well, 12 year olds for sure, but even as early as in third grade or kindergarten to determine their access to future rigorous learning events or current learning event environments. Course scheduling for new arrival students sometimes ensures that they will graduate without meeting college admission graduation requirements and they'll never have access to electives. These obstacles serve as barriers to students and their genius. They often result in adult mindsets around these students about what they believe students can and cannot do, and they have a direct impact on the culture of teaching and learning and our data use. Students may sit through years and years of repeated harm, dimming the light of their brilliance, feeling othered, 
as if this place for learning was never designed for them. These are why, among many other inequities, that learners are joining our classrooms with a different set of understandings than we expected. And when we hold these truths up to the light, that, that only, only then can we begin to dismantle these obstacles and truly center students. And that's really where we'd like to start the conversation today. The question that we'd really like to center our presentation around is how. How do we engage students in meaningful learning that builds on their unique differences and assets when they arrive in our classrooms? And to get us started, um, we'd like to share today with you a really exciting framework um, that we're bringing into the space, defining what we call high quality instruction as essential and equitable. At Student Achievement, Part at student Achievement Partners, we define the student-centered practice as grade level, joyful, linguistically sustaining, and culturally responsive and sustaining. Today, we hope to give you a quick glimpse into the framework and to share these four categories of high quality instruction with you to give you a window into what it means to support students in meaningful learning. Before we jump in, we're hoping you'll take a moment to pause the video to explore these categories and the three tenants that you'll see to the right of those categories. As you review the tenants, we hope that you see that they're written for their direct application to what this means for how math educators prepare for and implement instruction and what student outcomes and classroom experiences we might see as a result. For those of you wondering, we are also proud to have, in addition to a math framework of high quality instruction, we also have a cross content framework and a literacy framework. We invite you to pause the video now. All right, Shelby, yeah. I'll hand it back to you. Great, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the first tenet, which is grade level instruction. And grade level instruction expands on the popular definition linked to standards and shifts by acknowledging additional components of instructional design and student experience that create the conditions for students from diverse backgrounds to be able to engage with grade level instruction. And so I'd love to give you a couple of examples of what we mean by that. Um, first, I want to talk specifically and personally about why I believe prioritization of content is an approach to equity. And this really goes back to my days in the classroom. And so my very first day of teaching, um, I had a student raise his hand. They were These were 10th graders. And he said, he said, Miss, our last teacher treated us like we were dumb. Our last teacher gave us math tasks that we did back in fourth and fifth grade and we were supposed to be taking algebra one and so i got a very quick um, initiation into what it meant to be a high school teacher and so four years of pre-service teacher training a master's degree you can throw it all out the window at that point because you're faced with a reality that students recognize that the content they were receiving was not grade level um, and so, you know, I took a deep breath and I said, well, we have a lot of work to do then. Uh, so we needed to basically do two years of math in one year. And this was with students who the system had labeled as not ready. And so my approach to teaching was to always start with the question, how do I give every student what they need to keep moving forward? And so it meant looking through the resources that I had and identifying the highest priority highest complexity content and aiming at that with them. And so it often meant picking up some of the skills that we often see as separate lessons and saying, I believe that if I give rich tasks, my students can pick those skills up as part of that rich task. And that turned out to be true. And so when I talk about prioritization of content, which I know became much more um, prevalent during the pandemic, I, I do believe that it is an approach to equity that deeper learning experiences will give students what they need, even if it means streamlining some of the, lo the lower level skills that they need to pick up along the way. The second thing I wanna share here is why I personally didn't adopt the phrase unfinished learning. I understand like where it came from. People were very concerned that we were talking about gaps and I'm concerned about that too. Like I don't like referencing gaps. I've worked in the assessment space for a, quite a long time, um, but it didn't describe 
a, a context that even I had seen in the classroom. As an Algebra One teacher, if I were to ask my class, like, who has unfinished learning? I hope every hand would go up, right? That's why we're here, right? If we were done learning, we wouldn't need you. Um, so what I prefer to use instead is like, how do we give access to students to grade level content? And so I was teaching Algebra One. I didn't necessarily need to identify all of the things students hadn't learned. What I needed to figure out is what do we need to do together so that they can access the content of Algebra One. And so I'd love to shift the language. So unfinished learning in, in many ways still sort of assigns blame to the students. It's a lovelier way to say it than they have gaps, uh, but it's still assigning blame to children who are in a system that wasn't designed for them. And so I'd love to take that blame back to the adults and say, how do we work together to give access to the mathematics that students are supposed to be learning this year? The second tenet that I want to talk about is this idea of joyful instruction and fostering a positive intellectual and emotional environment for learning. Um, and this is in the way that we design, but the last part of this phrase is one that is very meaningful um, to the work that we do. And that is that students develop a love of learning. And so when I think about what that means, um, what does it mean to love learning? It means that we're delivering content in a way that prompts students to ask more questions. Like what I really wish <laughs> is that students were so excited by what they're learning at school that they come home and they're like, I want to learn more about that thing. And I'm currently working on a project um, with a high school math badging framework where that is absolutely central to the work that we're doing. And we're hearing lots of stories about students doing exactly that. So they're engaging in a math task, but within that math task, they're actually saying, oh, well, I wonder where these zip codes are. Or they're asking new questions that they want to go and explore more. And we often take away that opportunity. <laughs> like, kids will have questions about the math they're doing or a particular thing. Even a very simple example, my daughter was doing a math problem about sea glass. And like we often say, oh, just ignore it and pretend it's anything, pretend it's puppies. Um, but I gave her 30 seconds to go like look up what sea glass is. And in that 30 seconds, she's like, oh, cool, sea glass. And now she looks for it when we go to the ocean. So you, there are very little, little things we can do to make experiences more joyful. Um, I was in a school this morning and I heard a lot about compliance, about grades. We were at my kid's middle school sort of meet the teacher. I heard a list of things they would be learning. I didn't hear excitement, <laughs> right? The one thing like I really wanted to hear was like what fun my kids are gonna have, the cool things they're gonna be learning about. And I actually, I didn't hear any of that. And, and I believe that we, we have to change that. And so SAP has a lesson planning tool, the social emotional academic development tool that really helps support the intersection of um, students' experience and joy with the content standards. And so we've had great success in working with educators across the country in leveraging that tool as a way to really bring joyful learning back into education spaces. The next category that we want to elevate is linguistically sustaining uh, instruction. The, the evidence tells us that learning happens when educators identify students' strengths and leverage those strengths in the classroom. We've seen that non-standard English language and linguistic backgrounds have historically been seen as parts of student identities that should be managed or corrected before attending to academic content instead of strengths to be fostered during instruction. When I think about the joy that Shelby's talking about, part of that joy means seeing yourself and your language and the instruction and the thinking that's represented in the room on a daily basis. When we talk about linguistically sustaining instruction, it's intentionally pushing back on those deficit-based approaches and leveraging students' home languages regardless of the classroom model of instruction. And it sees those diverse linguistic backgrounds as assets to engage students during instruction to foster that deep content grade level learning that Shelby was talking about. One of the ways that um, 
this can show up in the classroom is when we can position multilingual learners, uh, multilingual students as intellectual leaders in the classroom. Oftentimes uh, you may go into a classroom and see students whose uh, multilingual language uh, abilities are, are never known or seen because those students may be in the back of the classroom or silent, almost invisible in those spaces. When multilingual students are positioned as intellectual leaders in the classroom, we see that the joy and assets of uh, the profound funds of knowledge that those students bring with them is really celebrated and becomes part of, of the cornerstone of learning. One of the ways that we can really elevate uh, linguistically sustained practices is providing students with opportunities to traverse between and among different representations. Here you can see a variety of representations elicited from a math milestones task um, over in the lower left corner. And you can see the different ways that students are expressing um, their thinking. But in particular, one of the exciting pieces that we see here is that not only does it help illuminate conceptions, but it also helps build connections for students and for teachers in their pedagogical thinking. And it also helps elevate that all student thinking is an important component of teaching and learning. And in particular here, you can see from the quote on the left that it can also impact the way that teachers think about the way that they teach and they access students' thinking. The last category we'd like to share with you and I would argue maybe the most important, but they're all really important. Uh, and we envision them all working in concert, but one where probably we have the most to learn is culturally responsive and sustaining instruction. This category of our E-squared framework is built on obviously the evidence from its predecessors, culturally relevant, responsive and sustaining pedagogies. In mathematics, it's hard often for folks to imagine what that looks like. So we wanted to share a few examples it can look as simple as countering traditional math structures of individualism and competition. When you walk into a classroom and see students in individual seats where they can't even, uh, my, my ninth grade teacher had me reach out my arms to make sure I couldn't teach, I couldn't literally touch any of the, of the colleagues in my classroom. Um, we're really looking for collaboration, reinforcing a collectivist approach. It also happens when students have agency in their learning to incorporate connections between home, community, and school. I'm imagining right now Shelby's daughter looking at looking on the beach for sea glass and then bringing that experience back into the classroom when they talk about that math task. And it's also fostered through intentional instructional design and student centered practices that acknowledge and leverage student brilliance in the classroom. So an example of what that looks like is one of the ways that that can show up is when the system and the educators leverage an asset-based approach to build and strengthen the relationships that elicit and center, I think that's key, so I'll say it again, that elicit and center the wealth of knowledge that students, families, and communities bring into the mathematical space to create a bridge to the relevance of learning. Um, one of the examples that I'll share from a, a previous district that I worked in in San Diego, in the San Diego Unified School District, this kind of illustrates this bridge between um, home identity, culture, language, and the classroom is a week long launch that we run through all secondary schools called Building a Community of Math Learners that includes a project that we lovingly call the world needs a mathematician like me. Part of this kind of week long adventure uh, results in students being able to describe the incredible diverse strengths and talents that they bring into this space, but it also helps them engage with different types of mathematicians, one that represents a window and one that represents a mirror. And also they engage in empathy interviews with their friends, thinking about what does it mean to be a mathematician and how are we going to work together to develop a common understanding of what it means to be a community of math learners. Uh, we've shared <laughs> these four tenants and some brief examples, but I know you're sitting there thinking, if only I could do a little bit of math. Uh, and so we would be remiss if we didn't give that opportunity. So I'll hand it over to Shelby to jump us right in. Great. Um, so just pause for a moment and think about what we've just heard. And I'm just going to read this. So close your eyes, get into it. It could be game changing if students experience joyful, sustaining and relevant mathematics. What would that mathematics look like? What would it feel like?
So I want to bring us back to sort of where we started. And if there's one thing I could encourage anybody viewing this video to do, it is to be more reflective of your language, of the language that you're using, of the language that you're hearing others use. Um, these labels on students are pervasive. They're driven a lot by a high stakes standardized testing environment that we live in right now. And we need to interrogate why we're using them, right? And I encourage you that if you do use one of these labels to really defend it, um, to, to ask yourself why you're using it, why is it necessary, and is there a better way? Is there a way to take the labels off of the students and bring them back to us and start talking about the design of the system? And so I love to think about redefining readiness um, I know a lot of test scores come back and they say students aren't ready for this because they underperformed in this. And like, I believe that if students show up, then they're ready. If they're there, then they're ready. I even had one student who didn't come for six weeks. You know, I wasn't sure if she was going to come to class. And guess what? When she got there six weeks later, she was ready. And we had work to do and we had to streamline and we had to think about how to ensure that she got everything she needed to re-enter the classroom, but she was ready. Um, so th here, this quote comes from an article that um, Ashley Powell and Kristen Gray wrote for us. The premise of linearity, which is big in math, spawns the false construct of readiness, that students must master one prior grade level concept or skill before they are ready to engage in the next. Um, so I really encourage folks to really think about this idea of, that we've created, that math is very linear, and ask instead the question that I said at the beginning, which is, what do I need to do to grant access to students to the mathematics that we need to learn? And this is very nuanced. I'm gonna just take you into a task now. This is very nuanced. And the reason I don't believe in like using test scores or anything like that to sort of identify what do students need from X to learn Y, it is so nuanced. Like for any given task that I wanna give, the what students need to know is really variable. And so one of the things we didn't talk a lot about today, but when I think about this idea of joyful and relevant content, we often fail to situate the academic standards within the context that students are living. And by that, I mean 2023 and beyond. And so we have a lot of really outdated tasks um, because we haven't asked, like, what are people doing with this in 2023? And in many ways, we're actually fighting against it. We're like, technology is scary. Um, let's lock them out so they can't use it uh, instead of like, well, this is the world they're living in. And so how do we give them the skills that they need to thrive in 2023 and beyond? So as I was um, constructing this task, the central thing for the grade six task was really getting them to think about what it's like to program technology. So oftentimes we wanna say, oh, if they use technology, they're cheating, they're gonna look this up. And I, I posit that we need to redefine cheating as well, like it, it's 2023. But I, I wanted to write a task where students were positioned as the programmer of the technology. And so instead of saying like they're cheating if they go look this thing up for converting measurements, it's how do we teach them that programming something to convert measurements is actually a pretty cool thing and is useful to a lot of people. Um, but first I thought about like, what do sixth graders, what would be some cool conversations about some of the things that they already learned to get them into this task? And so I found this diagram online that said 15 milliliter or 15 milliliters is equal to one tablespoon. So it was a tablespoon that said 15 milliliters, but it turns out it's not quite 15 milliliters. It's a little bit less. And so I wanted to create a task where we can get into a conversation about that because maybe in some cases it doesn't matter that you're off by, you know, two tenths. But when you start talking about five tablespoons or 10 tablespoons, like those differences actually add up. And so I created a task where I could revisit some of their prior learning about rounding, about positioning decimal numbers on a number line before I get them into the core task, which is here. And that is now take this true value of 14.7868 milliliters, which is closer to a tablespoon, um, and use that to generate an equation. So I think, Ali, if you type 14.7868T, 
Um, the cool thing about the technology that we have, if you hit submit, it will actually generate some values. And so students can see like when I program a technology to do something, then I'm helping somebody else do these conversions very quickly, such as doctors and nurses who may need to know like 15 milliliters is a tablespoon, but it's actually a little bit less. Um, so we want to design more relevant content, but I would add to that definition of relevance that we also want to aim toward future careers and really start to take into account the world in which students are living. And that's a world that standardized testing often locks them out of. So we want to close today by just offering you access to the framework that we presented on, where we lovingly refer to it as the E squared instructional practice framework. And so you can scan this QR code to access the framework and take a deeper look at it. And then just a list of some resources that we have found useful. Um, some of them are through our own organization and others are through other organizations that we work closely with. Uh, we hope that you'll explore more on this idea of really rethinking the concept of readiness and hopefully shifting some of the language back to like, how do we ensure that all students have access to what it is that we need to be learning together? So we wanna close with our vision. Um, black and multilingual students engage, feel they belong, build critical literacy and mathematics knowledge and skills and are positioned to apply those skills to choice-filled intentional lives. Thank you. How does this work align with ideas about learning progressions and trajectories? Thank you for that question, Pam. So I'm going to have you all take a look at the grade level section of our E squared framework in particular grade level. In that section, we really talk about focusing on the high level connections across standards or um, the widely accepted pre prerequisites, rather than focusing narrowly on uh, kind of uh, line by line standards. We're really looking for a prioritization of learning, thinking about the ways in which we can focus on the most important highest leverage concepts over um, niche skills that are unrelated to um, the most important concepts of the grade. Big ideas and how they connect to students. Oh, thank you, Pam. I can see big connections between uh, Pam, Pam and Kindle's book and the framework that we're sharing today. I hope, um, Pam, you see that. Um, and I hope that um, other participants um, also see that. And if you haven't read Choosing to See, you should. I'll just say uh, hello to everyone. Uh, who's here. So excited to see, see everyone. Um, I hope you continue having a great learning experience. Thank you for learning with us today. Bye.